This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got another special return guest of the podcast. His name is Joby Martin. And if it looks like I'm in a good mood, and if you can feel the pep in my voice, it's because I just love talking to this guy. I always have a good time when we talk with him. And most of the time when we talk, we don't record it. But this is the third time he's been on this show where we have actually recorded it. So he has been on episodes 307 and 371. But we have him back on here today to talk about his very new book. It is out now, and it is called... And no, sorry, I was about to give you the, the title of his own book, but anything is possible. How nine miracles of Jesus reveal God's love for you. So this book is a follow-up book to last year's book. If the tomb is empty, why the resurrection means anything is possible. So you might remember that name because we've added it to our 100 books. Every modern Christian man should read list. It was also one of our best books of the year for last year. But if you don't know who Joby Martin is, let's back up all the way to the very beginning. He is the founder and lead pastor of the church of 1122 in Jacksonville, Florida. He's also a speaker. And as you know, this, he's also an author and he also hosts the deepen with pastor Joby Martin podcast. But the thing about this, this episode is yes, he's my buddy. And so if we seem chummy throughout this, it's because this has become a good friend of mine over the last, you know, couple of years, we've really enjoyed getting to know each other and getting to know each other's ministries and supporting those ministries in different ways. But we basically go right out of the gate and we spend 95% of the talk, you know, talking about the new book, anything is possible. But the thing about it, is through that discussion, we're going to not just talk about the book. We're going to talk about, you know, what does it actually mean to be saved? What does that mean? And so we really dive in to the election pool and, you know, free will versus determinism and all those different things. We talk about the importance of Israel. We talked about, you know, skepticism in certain Christians. We talk about... um Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of everything because it was just such a great conversation that went all these different areas, but just what the church is actually for. Is it for saved people? Is it for Christians or is it for non-Christians who would be seeker sensitive? What about this new thing that we have with the bystander effect and why are so many Christians getting caught up just watching depraved things happen to people of God without trying to intercede? And then we get in towards the end. We start talking a little bit about, you know, some of the stuff that's gone on with Andy Stanley and a lot of pastors, a lot of prominent pastors, not saying anything about homosexuality, basically ignoring sin. I really enjoyed our discussion about that. And then we also get into critical race theory and how there's a lot of prominent pastors that are talking about critical race theory and they're saying, oh, it's just a lens through which we can understand the plight of people of color in the country. And no, you know, certainly, you know, Karl Marx was a satanic piece of garbage, but sure, let's just go ahead and, you know, read his words from the pulpit. We get into all that, but every time he comes on this show, you guys love it. And I really, really enjoy it. But I got to tell you, I think this is the best one of the three. So this is kind of like I'm trying to think of like the best movie trilogy. Okay, let's go, let's go John Wick. All right, so the John Wick new movie's out. It's probably going to be out by the time this episode airs or something like that. But those first three films, you just can't go wrong, right? But everyone's got their favorite. There, there are people that like, like I like John Wick three more than I like the other two, but if any one of them are on, I'm going to watch it. And so that's what I feel like the three conversations with Joby have been. They're all amazing. I personally have taken a shine to this latest one, but guys, I've pepped it up enough. But here it is. I'm not going to keep in front of you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Joby Martin, welcome back to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. What's up, buddy? How are you? I see you showing off the green hat. I got to say, I I really, really appreciate it because there are people that are mad at me right now that they didn't get their hands on one of those. But that was like the first one off the press. I sent it out to you. So I was just I didn't know the uh, post office ran to Jacksonville, Florida. That's that's pretty good. It does, and it is as advertised. You were super bragging on it, and it's really good. I, I like will it. say, I will say this as well. You sent me a picture like the day after you got that hat, and I was making fun. I was like, "Hey, I made it to be like a hunting hat, like an early season hunting hat." And you're like, "Yeah, I've already killed a gator and a hog wearing this hat." <laughs> and so it's like you've officially shed blood wearing that hat, which I can uh, very much so appreciate. But man, we got a lot of ground to cover today. I'm really excited to chat with you uh, about your new book. But I don't want to take for granted that anybody listening to this like knows you because you've been on the show twice before. But if they miss those episodes, how about you give us a quick overview who the heck are you bring us up to speed what is it that you do man i'm a nobody that wants to tell everybody about the somebody that wants to save them all right yeah Uh, i I pastor a church here in jacksonville florida we planted in 2012 it's called the church of 1122 um that's it man i've spent my life preaching and making disciples and uh i've decided to write a couple of books to further that endeavor along 
Well, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, guys, if you're listening to this on time, this book is out now. It is called Anything is Possible, How Nine Miracles of Jesus Reveal God's Love for You. But this is actually a follow-up book to your first book, which is If the Tomb is Empty, which was on our book list of the 100 books every modern Christian man should read list. We handed out some awards for that book last year on our Best Books of the of the Year Award thing. But, I mean, these, I was kind of, you know, making fun of you off air. I was like, this could have just been one really long book, but these definitely were kind of lockstep with one another. So tell me how the new book, Anything is Possible, like tell me about it just in general. How does it attach to the last book? You know, go wherever you want to go with it, and then we'll dig in. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we study nine different miracles throughout the New Testament that reveal God's heart and God's love for you. And even though I am a skeptic by nature for sure and probably even by nurture, the reason that you can believe in the miraculous is not because you're putting your faith in your circumstances. The reason that you can believe in the miraculous is because the greatest miracle that has ever happened has already happened. That Jesus walked out of the tomb, that, that God breathed new life into his dead son. And if he can do that, if he didn't withhold his own son, then what would he withhold from us? Now, there there is a chapter in there on, you know, what do you do when you don't get your miracle? And there's a chapter on how should we rightly respond with a heart of gratitude to the miracle working God. But the whole point is not the miracles. The whole point, in fact, in the Gospel of John, John doesn't even call them miracles. He calls them signs because signs point to something bigger. All I want to do in this book is just point people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to dig in quite a bit, but you mentioned something there that you talked about in the prologue, which is you talk about the fact that Jesus' disciples died for what they claim that they saw, which is the resurrection, not what for what they claim to believe or something that they saw written down on a tablet, but for something that they saw. And we see no evidence from any of the even secular historians from the first, second, third century of these these people, we'll, we'll stick to the first century, these eyewitnesses of the risen king reneging on that later and saying, no, 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 just kidding. Please don't sacrifice me and throw me to the lions or anything like that. But how, if you are a skeptical person by nat- nature, which you are and which I am, how that's kind of an interesting thing. So you do talk about that in the prologue, but also in the prologue, you talk about spending time in Israel. And so Mm -hmm. as far as I understand it, you just got back from Israel not that long ago. You've gone there several times. But the way that you describe Israel in the prologue, it actually makes you feel like you're there, like, you know, sniffing in the exhaust from all the, the different, you know, tour buses and things like that. But I guess why is it so important for Christians to actually go to Israel, because it's on my list. It's not a place that I've been yet, but some Christians are kind of dismissive. They're like, ah, you know, if I was Jewish, I would go to Israel, but it seems to be like that's the place you want to go. It's not like Mecca for for Muslims necessarily, but it is a place that Christians should probably pilgrimage to at some point, yeah? Yeah, there's a lot of benefits. I mean, it's not a requirement, like you said, like of other religions that are required to go to some place. I know we use the phrase the Holy Land, and holy means set apart. And so for sure, the nation of Israel is set apart in our in God's redemptive history and plays a significant role in his return. Like that's where his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives when he returns. Um, but it is just simply a means to an end. And the end is to deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ. For me as a Bible teacher, the reason I like to go is it just it just makes my Bible go from black and white to color. Hmm. Like when you were on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and the Bible says that he goes from here to there, and you can see where he's going from. Or when it talks about sending his disciples up to Bethany to get a donkey for, <clears throat> for the, the, the last week of his life, and you can see the trail that he would have ridden down, and the place probably where he stopped and looks over the wall of, <clears throat> of Jerusalem and weeps for his people and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I weep for you like a like a mother hen would love to gather her chicks under her wings. I mean, it just helps like crazy to see these places. When you go down to the Garden of Gethsemane and you see that this place was literally a place of crushing and that it was the place at the bottom of the Mount of Olives where they crushed the olives to make olive oil and it was the beginning of the crushing that Jesus was about to go through. And the place that matters more than anything else is when you can go to the empty tomb and see that, yes, it is, is still empty. And you see the details of the scripture in eyewitness with your very own eyes. You can see what Peter or what John was saying when Peter kneels down at the, at the empty tomb and he, and he peeks in and he can see into the empty tomb. It just 
it does the heart of the believer really, really well to go to that place and see it with your very own eyes. So it's certainly something that I wish that, that I, I say I wish I could do it. You can plan and do just about anything, but it's something that my wife and I, we used to travel internationally every other year kind of a thing. And we haven't done that in a while, having kids and, and you know growing our businesses and different things like that. But it's certainly on our list. And I would echo the sentiments that I've heard from you from other people that have gone and said the same thing. So let's dig a little bit more into the book itself. So I want to skip to chapter two. And chapter two is called The Paralytic. Do you believe Jesus will carry you? So I'm going to read a quote from that chapter here. I love this picture. One sick man carried by four good friends. It begs the question, do you have friends like that? Friends you can count on to carry you to Jesus. Now, for the majority of this chapter, I'm going to ask you, are you that kind of friend? But right now, I want to flip the mirror, take a second and answer that question, yes or no. Write your answer in the margin. Better yet, write their names. So a couple of paragraphs later, actually, Joby, you actually call these people, I love this, lower you through the roof friends. And so I, I love right. that. I mean, I call them 3 a.m. friends, right? So a lot of guys have 6 p.m. friends where you can call them until about 6 p.m. And then after that, they're not really available to help you move a fridge or bury a body. But it's those guys at 3 a.m. that you can call. You know they're going to answer. And you know they're grabbing their pistol and a shovel because they assume you're either about to bury a body or you need to bury one now. <laughs> and so it's those types of guys. But talk to me a little bit about that because most guys lament that they don't have friends like that anymore, right? Like like their fraternity brothers or like their guys from football two-a-days or their guys, you know, from the academy or their guys from the military. But then they don't do anything about it now. It's like, bro, you're 40, you're 50, you're 60. Like, I, I get it. You had a lot of good friends when you were a teenager. But, like, be an adult. Like, get some dudes around you that you can go to war with. Well, like, why do guys not focus on that anymore? Well, there's a lot, and I think there's a big difference between your fraternity brothers and your lower you through the roof friends because these four friends did whatever it took to bring this brother who was hurting to Jesus. So I'm not just talking about people that will go to war with you unless we're talking about the kind of war that Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, right, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. Yeah. Um, and, man, I, here's the problem, and men are terrible at this, is that we just settle for buddies. Yep. You got golf buddies and hunting buddies and jujitsu buddies and drinking buddies. And that's fine, man. It's fine to have some buddies. But if you limit yourself to just buddies, listen, good gospel brotherhood is like a retirement account. If you wait until you need it to get it, it is way too late. Yep. And so um, this is just how the Lord has wired us, man. Because we are image bearers of God and God is a triune God, one God in three persons, in a perfect love relationship, mutually submitted to one another. These are the kinds of relationships that we are to have. And so I'm just saying it's worth it. And in fact, if you'll just get focused on being one of the four corner friends, mm -hmm. then you will create those kind of friends that if you ever find yourself on the mat, they will tote you to Jesus. And I think that that's very important because whenever I talk about the foxhole, which is basically the way that I, I communicate about it, I yeah. talk to guys that are so concerned that they don't have a foxhole, and I'm like, well, well are you a foxhole guy? Because here you are lamenting that you don't have any 3 a.m. friends, but you don't answer your phone after 6. Like, you're not the guy. You're always the guy that's busy and unavailable when people need to build a fence or to move. And you got a truck, right. but you don't let anyone use it, right? And you don't even use it. Right. And so it's kind of one of those those situations as well. Also in chapter two, Joby, you talk about the church. And so a short quote from that chapter, you just say, our job in the church is to equip you. OK, so that's what you do. That's what you said from the jump whenever you're basically introducing yourself to our audience for anyone that wasn't familiar with you. But it begs the question, and I've really been thinking about this question even over the last several weeks. What slash who is the church for? Because when I read through scripture, it seems like the church is there to equip the saints, that the church is for Christians. Like it's to set them up, to get them ready to go and to send them out into the world. But I, it's, it's, I'm curious how that jives with the seeker-sensitive model, which basically says, yeah, 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 everyone that's a Christian, we don't really care about you guys. We're here, the music, the preaching, the everything we do, the programs are for the lost folks. We don't really care about equipping y'all as much. And so that's the thing that I feel like there's, there's this dissonance, even for people that, regardless of the church they go to, they're like, what is this here for? Like, who is this for? So help me out with that a little bit. It's an easy answer, man. Uh, the church is not for the lost. The church is not for the saved. The church is for God. The church exists to glorify God. He is the audience. When you gather together, you're making much of him. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, so then God, how do we honor you? How do we worship you? How do we bless and minister to you? 
Well, does God love saved? Does God love lost people? For sure. So, I mean, he tells us in the Great Commission, the whole point is to go and make disciples of everywhere. And nobody reads that verse and thinks it means go find people that already know Jesus and tell them more things about Jesus. Mm. Everybody understands that verse. Go tell lost people about the gospel so that they would come into the family. And does God love sent people? Yes. And so we, we simultaneously build up the body so that they, they can go reach the lost and accomplish the Great Commission. It's not either or. It's both and. So at 1122, we are a movement for all people to discover and deepen a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, and those two things are always simultaneous. They're, they are not in opposition of one another. So let me ask you this, because I've talked to several people that they go to a more seeker-sensitive church, and maybe they've mm -hmm. gone there for a while, it's really comfortable, they like the music, they like the preaching, it's funny, or whatever, but they've gotten to a point where they're like, I'm, I'm not being discipled, and it's not, because you, you know the difference when someone's like being real selfish, being like, well, the church isn't meeting my needs, it doesn't sound real whiny like that, it's like people that are like, I, like, I feel like I've been eating the same meal for years now, and, and I'm looking for that that heavier meat. You know, I'm looking for the elk steak, and I've been eating ramen noodles for all these years. So I guess what would you say to someone that goes to a church like that, that, that they're like, look, you know, th this is what it is. Like, the, our style is our style. Our, our preaching is our preaching. We're not going to do extra classes. We're not going to do Sunday school. We're not going to encourage, you know, home groups with different materials. Like, what would you what would you say to them? What are they to do? I don't know the church that doesn't that doesn't offer like a next step beyond Sunday morning. So if there are some of those, then you know maybe there are, but I'm just not aware of them. So my question: I would always try to hold up the mirror before I try to hold up the binoculars, you know, and see what everybody else is doing wrong. My first, like if if the individual was saying that, I would say, well, just just help me understand what steps of obedience are you taking, and tell me what disciples are you making. Because the the time that the disciples always get in trouble, if you just do a if you just do a quick study of the four Gospels, they always got in trouble when they got focused on them and what they wanted or what they weren't getting or even what they didn't understand. Jesus always high-fived them when they got really busy about helping other people discover their relationship with Jesus. And so that would be the first place. Now, if you're not in a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church that is centered on the good news of the gospel, life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus, then you might be at the wrong church, mm. you know? Um, and you are right. There are some churches, and I know you know all these churches because you call them out by name every week. Um, <laughs> and they would say that their job isn't to make disciples, but is just to reach people. I, I don't think that is a, a healthy New Testament view of who the church is. I think we're supposed to help people discover and deepen and demonstrate what it looks like to be in a right relationship with Christ. Yeah, and what's what's interesting, we've had a lot of conversations off air. That's one of the reasons why I'm way more precise, and you help me be more precise in yeah. my language about churches, because what people were hearing me say is, if your church has a big parking lot, they're not serving <laughs> Jesus. And I was like, oh, no, that's that's technically what I've been saying for months, and it's not what I meant. So, And guys, uh, we're going to move on to chapter three here, but the, the book is in the show notes, and we are barely scratching the surface. I mean, we're going to go deep in this interview about a lot of the content of the book, but there is so much there. It is a very, very dense book for only being about a, a 250 pages or so. So, but chapter three is called healing at the pool of Bethesda. Mm. Do you believe Jesus can heal you? Now you, you talk about some different healings in this book. And there's obviously there's a, there's a great story at the very, very end of the book that will let people uh, read for themselves. But something I wrote in the margins, Joby, while I was reading through that chapter is, but what if he doesn't? And I don't mean that in the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, like even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him all the same and not, not in that sense, but I didn't grow up in church. But I grew up in Oklahoma, so I was a Christian by dint of birth, right? You know, because I was born on that red clay. And so it's kind of that, it's almost like that country music Christianity to where it's like you can talk about God and the man upstairs and how you're, you're, you're not too good at praying, but here's, here's what you're going to offer. The problem is, is when your brother gets cancer and you pray for him, family prays for him, you take him to church, they do a prayer meeting, they put hands on him, everyone's crying, snot everywhere, and they pray for your brother, and he dies mm -hmm. of cancer the next day. What I always feel like, Joby, is Christians have this cop out to where it's like, we're going to pray and we're going to pray and we're going to pray and God's going to make a move. But then if he doesn't, or if the, the prayer is answered with a no, Christians just say, well, yeah, but I guess that just wasn't God's will. And that always struck me as disingenuous 
And even when I became a Christian, it still struck me as disingenuous because God is not our cosmic genie that we ask him for things so we get it no matter what. I mean, people people got to die at some point, like whether it's your grandma or it's your best friend, everyone's going to die at some point. But I know there are a lot of Christians that struggle with that. And to be honest, I struggle with that too. And it, it, it affects how I pray, if I'm being honest, because it's like, I pray like, all right, God, do whatever you're going to do. Like, you know what I want? Like, I would prefer my friend not to die, please. But if he does, I guess that was meant to be. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's why I wrote chapter four. Um, it's right after the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus says this crazy thing. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And so people, people got an answer that they didn't want. So they start to leave. I mean, think about this. Can you imagine they're sitting there taking notes and they're like, what did he say? Eat, eat my fish? Because we, we can't even eat pork. Surely we can't eat the prophet, right? right? And then he doubles down on it, triples down on it. He just won't quit talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And then everybody leaves. And then he looks at Peter and says, do you want to leave too? And the reason he asked him is because he wants to leave. And here's, here's ultimately how easy it would have been. Jesus could just step in in that second and say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, everybody sit down. I don't mean you actually have to take a bite out of my forearm. What I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about this thing we're gonna, I'm going to institute in a few chapters called communion, which is a picture or an illustration of the gospel. And unless you surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ because I die on the cross for you and you believe it counted for you, unless you do that, you have no part with me. However... He explains nothing, and he could have explained it that quickly. Hmm. And then he says, so Peter, without explanation, do you want to leave too? Peter's answer is what helps me get through it. When I'm writing this book, my best friend just died on a hunting trip with me. A guy I led to Christ, baptized him on a mission trip. He's a general contractor. He literally builds all of our churches, bro. Uh, there's a long list of people I think the Lord should take out. Bradley wasn't one of them. I mean, I'm sitting in my office right now. I still keep a picture of him right there, bro. This is my dude, man. You know, like, in, in fact, he was one of my mat carriers. He was one of the four corner guys. And I'm just like, Lord, I, I, I don't get it. And I think the people in a real relationship with the Lord, are, they know they can bring their R-rated prayers. Like, how about this? How about David prays? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Way before Jesus quotes it on the cross, David right. prays it in Psalm 22, and the Spirit of God's like, that's good, David, write that down. We're going to keep that one in the book forever. You ever feel like that? God, how long will you ignore me? I think that's Psalm 13, maybe. So God can handle those prayers, but it's Peter's answer that gets us through. Jesus says, do you want to leave too? And he goes, to whom shall we go? You're the only one that offers eternal life. So he's like, I don't know why you would do the, this sermon on blood and flesh and all that. And just like, I don't know why you would take my best friend home who had a lot of life left in him and was just trying to make disciples with his life. But here's what I do know. You're the only one that offers eternal life. And so the opposite of faith is not doubt. If you've got doubt, cool, man. Pick up your doubts. Pick up your unanswered questions and just follow after Jesus knowing that because of the gospel, he is the one that offers eternal life. And then that's how you pray. I, when I pray, I don't try to give God an out, man. I mean, I'm not, I'm not being like, Lord, just thy will be done. No, nah, man, you said you have not because you asked not. The place we get that prayer is in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus says, thy will be done. Bro, mm -hmm. he prays it three times. You ever pray something and don't get the answer you want? That's what Jesus does. He goes, I'm going to come back. Let me just ask one more time. Then he comes yeah. back again. Let me just check one more time. If there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. So, man, I'm asking God for miracles. I'm asking God to heal people. I'm asking God to save people. And not just like, Lord, I know that you have elected some and not others. Therefore, no, man, that's not my prayer. My prayer is, God, I know that your will and desires that all would come to faith in you. And so, but we live in a broken world, man. And um, I think there, just like I can explain John chapter 6 and what Jesus meant with eat my flesh and drink my blood, it takes about two seconds. Paul says, right now we see dimly, one day we will see clearly. So when we get there, we'll be like, oh, okay, I get it. But until then, like a kid just wearing out his father, I'm going to ask and ask and ask and ask, knowing that God can, believing that God will, 
And then even if he doesn't, I'm still going to follow him because where else am I going to go? When I think the other thing about that is if you look at, you know, a pie chart, I've seen this used before, you know, against atheists, but when people are like, yeah, God certainly doesn't exist. And then you, someone will ask them, well, what percentage of all of the information in the universe do you know? And the person will be like, ah, you know, less than 1%. And so they'll get a pie chart and there'll be like one little sliver. And it's like, that's what you know. And then there's all this other information and you're telling me God can't exist there. The same applies to Christians. And so when a Christian, if you're in that moment and your best friend dies when he wasn't supposed to, according to you or according to anyone, you can look at that and say, this is how much I know. Like, I know so little that I can't find a fine tip marker, like thin enough to, to represent the line of stuff that I know about things. But God knows all of that. So for me to sit here and assume that doesn't mean not don't be sad. That doesn't mean don't cry. And you go into that in the book. But like that, that just means, look, there's something else happening here that Jesus or that God is going to redeem for his purposes because we live in a post Genesis three world where everything is broken and we got tornadoes coming after us and all kinds of stuff. Like I get it, but that's kind of one of those things that I look at as well. Like when I do get in one of those, those places, Joby, where it's like, okay, I remember that little bitty sliver of what I know. And I think I'm a smart guy, but at the same time, it's like you, you, you ultimately don't know anything. But also in chapter three, we'll we'll get to chapter four in a second because you do make some great points there that is related to this. But there's a quote from chapter three I want to read here. Oftentimes the reason that Christians are getting their butts kicked spiritually is because they're not ready for the fight. And then you talk a little bit about Alexander Solzhenitsyn and the Gulag Archipelago, and then you actually directly quote Solzhenitsyn, and, uh, and his quote is this, a person who is not inwardly prepared for the violence committed against them is always weaker than the one committing the violence. And then you, you end that with be prepared. That's so right. when you talk about, okay, be prepared for what? And then like, what is it that Christians are not doing to get themselves ready to go spiritually for the fight? Well, when I first read that, my first thought was spiritual warfare. I mean, man, the enemy has already got you <laughs> right where he wants you. If you don't even think he exists or the demonic is a reality or that he only wants to steal, kill, and destroy. I was actually reading that book because I'm a Peterson fan just like you are, and he talks about it all the time. And um, I was reading it on a hunting trip, and I've always mm-hmm. thought it – I'm a big hunter. I mean, if you're watching, you can see a bear behind me that I shot. All right, so I love to hunt. I've always thought it a little bit ironic that we call it a sport because only half of us that are playing realize that the game has started. Right. Right. So the deer does not know that the game is on. Right. So a part of the reason you're so successful is because he don't even know you're trying to kill him. Yeah. That sounds like almost every evangelical Christian I know when it comes to the enemy who only wants to steal, kill, and destroy uh, one of the things that you love to talk about is about how the enemy is about about like public school systems today, right? Mm-hmm. How many Christian parents have been completely caught off guard because they had apparently they haven't read their Bibles and saw that oftentimes what the enemy wants to do is take out an entire generation of boys. He did it with Moses. He did it with Jesus. He's trying to do it with ours. Yeah, and read so, Exodus, <laughs> Exodus 2. Like, that's what Pharaoh wanted to do. If it weren't for the midwives, that entire story is different. But go ahead. Right, and Luke 2, and Matthew 2, right? So he mm-hmm. did it over and over and over. And so if you, I love I love um, that quote, because if you come into the ring not realizing a fight is about to happen, you're going to lose. And what Stolzhenitsyn was talking about specifically is that the Russian police were picking people off of the street and the police had predetermined we're going to have to be violent to get them in the car. And the person being arrested did not realize there was going to be a fight that day. How many mm-hmm. believers wake up every day and don't realize you're in a fight? That's why you're getting your tail handed to you. I think the other thing that is important as well, because we talk about this in terms of preparedness. Mm-hmm. Like I literally saw a video yesterday. It was a social experiment, but they had a little uh, a little boy walking down the street in New York or Boston or something like that. He's probably seven. And then this man would run in from the side, grab the boy and grab him by his mouth and then run into an alleyway because they wanted to see how people would react. And everyone was on their phones. Now, there was one guy that was kind of on his phone, semi distracted. He saw what happened. He immediately looked concerned and then did nothing. Right. right? So go ahead. I got a story. This happened Monday. We're recording this on Thursday. This happened on Monday. My son, who's a football player, wrestler, weightlifter, athlete, 17 years old. He's going to school. He's, he's the first one at the stoplight. 
somebody runs the stoplight and T-bones this car, flips it on its side, and he says, and my little girl's in the car with him, you know, they're seeing this. The car slides 20, 30 yards. He immediately tells Reagan, you sit right there, and my boy gets out of the car, runs to the car, flipped over. He says they're screaming. It sounds like a horror movie. Him and one other grown man, like, wrenched the door open. He was like, Dad, it was crushed. It wouldn't open, but these ladies were screaming. He said, we got the door open. The ladies bleeding. We, we, we unbuckle them all from the seatbelt. We bring them out. And then he said, I looked around. He's starting to get, like, mad tears in his eyes, right? Yeah. And he's like, Daddy, I looked around, and I'm a kid. I'm a 17-year-old kid. And I look around, and there's grown people all around me, and they just have their phones up videoing it. And he said, and I was like, buddy, you can say it. And he was like, a bunch of you know what he said. And I was like, you're dang yeah. right. You were a man, and they were a bunch of sheep. And as I think about it, I'm telling you, people roll to church that way. Yeah. Listen, the way I see lost people is just like those people caught in that car. And and there's so many churches that are sitting in that car looking at everybody else and looking at a car wreck and going, well, you know, somebody else might have to do something about that because we, we got plenty to do in our own car. Not me, man. Not me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever it takes, rip the roof off the place, build more places, more seats, whatever it takes to help lost people come to Christ and then disciple them so that I got, I got a bunch of like my sons. So when he sees other people in need, then he's going to get out there and do whatever it takes. And listen, dude, you just experienced that, Kyle. Mm -hmm. I just listened to you this morning about what God did in your heart over this last week when you shared the gospel and two prisons and a men's thing, and 40 men came to Christ, right? And so people that want to be real critical of the big church, listen, man, what you experienced this weekend, we just been experiencing it for it's just 10 years, 52 weekends a year. Well, you end up with a whole bunch of people that way. But this does not mean we care about the loss any less today just because we got big rooms. We just want to, just like these four guys, we just want to, if the room's full, we'll tear the roof off so that everybody can get to Jesus. There's so much there that I want to comment on, but on that last thing that you said, going back to that story, guys, you have to understand the architecture of the buildings that they were doing in this day. We read this story and we just assume that everyone that lived before 1970 had like a roof made out of straw. Mm. No, these men were basically pulling off layers of, of stuff that probably took weeks, if not months, to build back in the day. They were literally destroying a home. Imagine going on your roof of the house that you live in, and you and three of your buddies trying to get through the top of that building to drop right. your buddy through. It's similar. It's more similar to that than it's dissimilar. But I did an episode years ago. Go ahead, Joby. Well, here's the thing. Guess who was uncomfortable with that? The people that already had the seats. The people right. in the front row, like they had the good seats listening to with Jesus. With dust falling on them, and there's crap falling down around them. So, so at our church, we don't mind making the people that already have a seat uncomfortable to make room for the people that need a seat. Yeah, but I mean that's that's another thing throughout the book. Like you were even talking about, you know, the the paralytic that was healed. Like, and you talked about, oh, you know, roll up your mat and leave. You can just read that line and move on with your life. No. He crapped on that mat. He slept on that mat, having not been bathed for for months, if not years, at a time. Thirty years. Like, yeah, I mean, it was disgusting. It wasn't your yoga mat that your wife just took to class earlier today. But also, I did an episode a couple of years ago, Joby, called the modern bystander effect. Mm. And so, the bystander effect is where people will they get frozen looking at something and then they can't respond to help. And I talked about it in a modern sense. It's like modern wise, we can just pick up our phones. And then we can video something happening because there was a video taken, I think it was in Philadelphia, of a woman that was being raped on a train, right? And these people, as opposed to interceding in this woman being raped, they pulled out their phones to film it. Now, if you're 85 years old and you can barely walk, the police are probably going to need video of what happened. Pull out your phone, sister. But for everybody else... That's why I get so frustrated when guys are like, I want to be known for what I'm for, what I'm not what I'm against. And these these pacifist Christians, because it's like, look, if the Imago Day is being violated, there's no time for a Bible study. There's no time for a prayer circle. It's time for you to put hands on somebody no and to protect the sheep. And and I dude, something similar happened to me 
driving home from college. I was probably about a year older than your son is now. And I see a car on the other side of the highway go up over the bridge and land in a tree. Mm. I'm, not, I'm dead serious. If I'm, if I'm lying, I'm dying. So I yank my car over to the side of the road, my 87 Buick Skylark. Yes, I was a pimp even back in the day. <laughs> and so I take off running across the highway. I'm, I'm, di- I'm running in between cars. And by the time I get there, the guy's out of his car. He had fallen asleep at the wheel. He was, uh, it was a miracle. He was fine. And I'm looking around at all these adults, and this isn't in the you know smartphone era. We don't have iPhones yet. I'm like, has anyone called Highway Patrol? And, uh, you know, just people like adults, like 40, 50-year-old men, just like, oh, I don't really know. And I'm like, okay, here, I'm 18 years old. I will g- grab my phone, deep, beep, beep, and I will, you know, pound 55, and I'll get somebody here that can get this guy's car out of the damn tree. Mm. And so it's just, there's so much more that we, that we can get into there. I do want to get back to the book, but there's a lot of great stuff there that, that the guys just really need to take to heart. But th- your book isn't without levity. Right, there's some serious stuff that you talk about, but you also uh, get people thinking kind of in a funny way. So let's go to chapter four. It's called The Feeding of the 5,000. Do you believe even when doubt creeps in? And I've got a really long question here in a second, but here's my shortest question of the day. Here's a quote. Are you willing to look like an idiot for Jesus? Okay, so give us some background. Why would you even put that in the book? Are you willing to look like an idiot for Jesus? Well, because if you look at this miracle, man, the feeding of the 5,000, the, Jesus didn't feed the 5,000. I know it's his power that provided the, the, the miracle that happened, but Jesus takes the fish, takes the loaf, blesses it, and then hands it to the disciples and says, you feed them. Imagine if you're one of the disciples. You got like a little, and it wasn't even a big fish, bro. They're like sardines and a half a piece of bread. And then yeah. you turn around, and, and what are you thinking? I mean, you're thinking, well, I got two options. I, I can save face and be like, I don't think I can do this. Or I can risk looking like a fool and do whatever he tells me to do. Which, by the way, same thing in, in John chapter 2, the waiting at Cana. He mm-hmm. tells them, dip out some of this water that the guys have been washing their hands in for the last four days and take it to the master of ceremonies. All right. So if you can't think of a time, like maybe in the last year, where you were about to do something that on the surface seemed crazy, it may be you're not, you're not obeying the voice of your shepherd. Because God will ask you to do some stuff, like make that phone call to ask for forgiveness, share your faith one more time with that person that's turned you down 10,000 times, or make the, make the crazy decision to raise your kids in a place that does tell them it's okay that they can have two dads or two moms or we're all just a bunch of accidents. That may seem crazy to the rest of the world, but look, man, I don't want normal. You can have normal. Normal in this world is broke, lonely, and depressed. You can have normal. I want the abundant life that Christ has for us. And so the only way you get that is doing what he says. This miracle doesn't happen if the disciples don't do what he says. And the miracle did not happen in the heavenlies. It happened in the hands of the disciples. I mean, think about it. At some point, they, they realize, like, oh, my gosh, I give away and give away and give away, and I still have more to give away. How is this happening? So what's funny is as you're describing that, Joby, and as I was reading in the book, so I'm watching the the third season of The Chosen right now, which all of a sudden I realize that there's like droves of people that hate that show. We don't have enough time to get into that today, but I just don't understand you people. <laughs> I don't but either. It's the, it's the part where Jesus is saying, hey, I got to go away for a little bit, so I'm going to send you all out two by two, and you're going to go to all these different places. Oh, by the way, I'm going to hand you the, the keys to my power, essentially. And they're just like, what? And they just like, they have no idea what they're going to do, but it's like, look. I'm going to do my miracles through you. Yeah. And I, I, again, every time I think about how confused I get at reading the Bible, I think you even make this point in the book. It's like the disciples were with Jesus for three years and still didn't get it. You got Thomas that needs to see the hands and the, the holes in the hands and in the, the wound in the side. Like they, they can't fathom that Jesus came back. It's like, Y'all got to see the miracles. So, guys, if you're talking to that stick in the mud atheist that, you know, he says he needs 10 million explanations for something, no, he needs 10 million and one, and then he needs 10 million and two. He's never going to be satisfied because it's the difference between a skeptic and a cynic. A skeptic just asks really, really tough questions. A cynic can never be satisfied. But there are people, even in that day, that didn't come to Christ. There were people that saw the resurrected Jesus. That didn't believe in him. They didn't put their faith in him. Like, that is something that actually happened that, that what we do have here. <laughs> yeah, so, Matthew 28 says that when Jesus ascends to the right hand of God, some worshiped and others doubted. Think about that. Like, if you're standing there and you see a guy <laughs> that you saw killed like 52 days before this, and then now there he is floating up or, 
or Rocket Man up, or I mean, you know, Iron Man to heaven, and you're like, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm still not convinced. I still got questions. It's like, okay, like I, I totally get it. So, all right, Joby, I went from my shortest question of the day to this is easily probably going to be my longest setup to a question. So it's going to take me a minute to unpack this, but follow along. But it, 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 it's basically around the question of how is someone saved, which I believe the first time you and I chatted about your first book, you know, that's something that I asked. But this gets into do, do the predestination versus free will arguments. But this is all stuff that we get from, from pr- chapter four and then on from there. So let me read this quote from chapter four. Some theologians love to say, OK, so which one is it? Does God draw or does God have to decide or, do, or does everybody have to decide? Jesus responds, right, right. Some of my pastor buddies get hung up on this whole thing. Election versus free will. They go round and round and round. And look, I'm all for vigorous discussion about the word, but here's my response. What can the dust do? Dust can't make itself alive. He breathed into us and we came alive. The initiation started with him. He elected us, not the other way around, in his lungs. Said another way, he chooses me and then gives me the ability to respond to him. And yet if I don't receive him, I'm going to hell. And I can take zero credit for following Jesus. I can't wrap my head around that. The good news is that he allows me the freedom and time to deliberate choosing him until he gets tired of it and chooses him for me through me. Okay, so you write that in chapter four. Yep. But then in chapter seven, you write this. If you are reading this or listening to it, then God is calling you. It's time to realize you're in a burning car, funny enough, uh, from what we just talked about. You're in a burning car and reach out for his hand. He wants to pull you from the blaze, which begs the question, if dust can't make itself alive, can dust reach out his hand? But then in chapter eight, you write this. Here's the truth of you and Jesus. Jesus chose you, and yet he gives you the right to receive him or not. So a question that I've asked from to some of my very, very reformed people, and I'll make it short. Let's say you're a custom knife maker, and you decide you're going to make me a custom knife. So you pick the metal, you, you pick out, you know, the handle, you make it. I don't even know you're making it for me. And then you're done. You've made it. And now you are presenting it to me. And you're like, Kyle, here's this, this, this knife that I made you. It's gorgeous beyond belief. You did nothing to deserve it. In that moment, is it automatically my knife? Or do I actually have to reach out my hand and take possession of it? But I'm not done, Joby. I'm not done. Because in chapter 9, you write this. If you've never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I am begging you to repent, trust Jesus, and be saved. Which begs another question. Why would you beg someone to do something when they can't do anything to gain salvation anyway? So, here's my question after all that setup. When I read a book like this, when I listen to the sermons of John MacArthur, when I read some of my favorite Christian apologists or, or, or thinkers from back in the day, and the question is, is how is one saved? It is this convoluted mess of nonsense that no one seems to be able to get it straight because it's like even John MacArthur writing a letter to uh, the governor of his state saying, stop, you know, with all the, the scripture on your, your sign saying the women should come to their state and kill their babies, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> and then he's saying, he's, he's the Mr. You can't do anything guy, but then he's telling this guy to do things. He's telling the governor, you need to repent. You need to turn from this. You need to do that. It's very, very confusing to everyone. I've sufficiently in this setup, Joby, pissed off all the reformed people, all the Armenian people, and all the people that don't even know what label applies to their worldview. So help me. How in the world is someone saved, Joby? Tell me. That you put your trust in Jesus Christ. But but am I actually doing that? Or because you're it's about, like you're talking I, about two different things. Okay. You're talking about different things. You're talking about like the mode and method of how you were able to. That's one question. Okay. The other question is, what must I do to be saved? The Bible is very, very clear all over the place. You believe. You pastuo is the Greek word. Mm-hmm. You trust. And, and you said it in prison because I heard you. And you, you, you use the language I use. If you believe when Jesus Christ died on the cross, somehow that counted for you. And you put your trust in him, not you. That's... That's what it takes to be saved. Now, how is one able to do that? Those are the questions that you're asking. Mm. So we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Sure. So that none of us can both. But even the faith we have is a gift from God. So Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. So these two things can be simultaneously true and held in tension. That 
God saves, period. It's not you. God saves. And you have a responsibility to place your faith in Jesus Christ. But if you just go one layer deeper on that one, then the only way that you have faith to put in Christ is because he gives you that gift, period. So, so I appreciate you, you drawing that delineating point because I don't know that I've ever seen that in my own philosophy of, of kind of dealing with this. When you get into the discussion of election, which is not what we're going to spend the rest of our time today talking about, I swear to goodness, we got other we things we need to cover. The thing with election that goes beyond just rubbing people the wrong way, it not only makes God the author of evil, <clears throat> it means that God, being all-knowing, being all-omni-everything, all-omni-whatever the second part of the word would be, he knows that he is creating people for eternal destruction. And that is something, because Maybe. I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, you know, uh, no. God's loving and can't do bad things or mean things. Like, I'm not one of those people, but it's like, man, that, that I struggle now, especially because I've got two boys. And now it's like, holy crap. Like, I think my wife and I are going to be hanging out in heaven if that's, you know, our setup. But what if my boys aren't elect? What if I do everything to surround them and marinate them in, in Christian culture and in the words of God? But then at the end of the day, they're not elect. Like, those are the things that, that keep me up at night, literally. Yeah, they should. That's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 9 and 10. In fact, he looks at his brothers and sisters and he says, in tears, I would, I would may I be accursed that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. <clears throat> but... The question is not like how you feel about it. The, the reason that I believe in election is not because of the way it makes me feel. The reason I believe in election is because that's just what the Bible says. It just says it. So, I mean, bro, if you want to get on the, the, on the election or free will conversation, the, the place that that's always going to end is in Romans chapter 9. What, what is the clay going to say to the potter? I mean, that's it. You're going to get to a place... Where God just says, "What's that clay? <laughs> What's that?" Yeah. So, 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 do you think you're saved because you're smarter than everybody else? Do you think you're saved because you're better than everybody else? Do you think you're saved because somehow you figured it out and nobody else can figure it out? Or do you think you're saved because you were just as evil and vile and wretched as everybody else? And by grace, I gave you the gift of faith, and you responded rightly and said, "I believe in you." Died on the cross; it counted for me. Because okay. I'm telling you, man, when I am, like, if if, if, um, if I was sitting next to a prisoner while you were preaching this weekend, and you got, to the, you got to the invitation part, if I believed it was up to this guy next to me solely to put his faith in Christ, I would interrupt your prayer, and I would bring him over, and I would say, hey, any questions, let me explain everything to you to make sure you make the right decision. But that's not what I would do in that moment. What I would do is I would beg God to save this man and rip out his heart of stone and give him a heart of flesh. I would beg him to do that. I would beg God to give that man eyes to see that he better put his faith in Jesus Christ. So, and, I, and I just say that because that's what, the, that's what the Bible says. I think some of the things you're saying, you don't want to be more reformed than the scriptures are. So the reason I feel really good about simultaneously talking about the election of God for his chosen people, plus I am begging people to put their faith in Christ is because that's what the Bible does. Ephesians okay. 2 talks about the fact that we, we've been elected. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul implores us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, making our request on behalf, like God is making his request through us. That request is like to beg. I mean, it's like the dad in Luke 15 when he goes out to entreat his older son, he is that word entreat means at great humiliation to this mega wealthy landowner in the Middle Eastern honor society is on his knees begging his son, won't you please come in the party? So when I preach, I know I can't preach anybody in heaven, and I beg people to please put their faith in Jesus. Okay. So I just I just know the only way they can is if God saves them. So that's really interesting because that was kind of my mindset going into that prison, feeling the weight of this moment. And yeah. I tried to tell people, I was like, look, I was built to get up in front of people and open my big fat ginger mouth. But what comes out, what comes from that, right? It, that's not on me. But where I guess there's a lot of things there. And so let, let's dig a little bit deeper into that, but, but not, you know, without, blow, you know, let's not blow up the entire interview here. That brings up, I know that there are reformed folks who, whom I love and respect and love having conversations with. 
that say if you use the word decision at all, that, that you're not doing it right. And so when someone's like, yeah, I've decided to follow Jesus, that's their least favorite hymn on the entire planet. It's the worst possible thing you could say because it's like, you didn't do anything. Because if you say you made the decision, I was like, oh, are you just the ultimate decider? Are you the greatest decider in the history of deciders? You decided to follow Jesus? That That's a struggle for people. But this also gets into a discussion of the inerrancy of the Bible because you're like, well, this is how someone's saved because this is what the Bible says. You got a lot of buddies, you know, a lot of millionaire pastors out there right now that basically don't have a high view of the Scripture, and they don't actually want to tie anyone's salvation to what happens and what is talked about in the Scriptures. These are people that are like, you know, hey, we don't need to even talk about the Old Testament like because it's not the Old Testament that saves you, even though it's the Old Testament that gives us a reason why we should have looked to Jesus at all and known what it is he was even doing there on the cross. So talk to me a little bit about that, about the whole decision language, because, again, that goes back to the, the Bible, and the Bible doesn't use the word decide necessarily. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Joshua says, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So it's Bible language. That, look, man, I get it, bro. I'm an Acts 29 person, so, you know, I swim in the Reform Sea with all those dudes. And there are so many people that are just, and I love them. I love it, and I love the organization, and we plant churches with them and all the things, man. And then there are some these, like, theological beatniks over here, and they just sit around and, you know, put their mustache wax in and drink their IPA and smoke a pipe. And nuance, which I'm with you, I hate that word, nuance on all these little... I mean, how are you going to be critical of an of a hymn that's been around for a couple hundred years? Man, shut your face, okay? <laughs> you can have that little conversation over there. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stand on stage tonight at our church. I'm preaching Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to present the gospel. I'm going to just... I'm going to preach the gospel that... that that by works of the law, no one will be declared righteous, okay? And that we have to have this alien righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And I am going to ask people to surrender their life to Christ, but I just know the only way they can is if God calls their name. So back to the empty tomb. Mm -hmm. Mary gets to the empty tomb, and she has all the evidence there, and it's not enough. It's not until Jesus, who she thinks is a gardener, it's not until he calls her name, then she says, Rabboni, which means like, that doesn't mean rabbi. Yeah. That's like a term of it. She's like, oh my God, teacher, I love you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know theologically because of this book, that's how it happens. And and if <laughs> if you're going to be smart enough to lead, lead people, man, you got to have space in your brain to be able to hold multiple truths in tension, knowing that somehow... There's no way I can get a complete understanding of the soteriological realities of God in regards to the salvation of man. I just know this. If you don't preach, and if people don't believe, they don't get saved. And they don't choose him, he chooses them. And my job is to make an appeal that they would be reconciled to God. So my favorite, man, is you take a super reformed guy like John Piper, and listen to him preach about it. And he says, he says, I would stand before a crowd of people, knowing how people get saved, and beg people, won't you come, won't you come, won't you come? Hmm. So I would warn people to not be more reformed than the Bible. By the way, uh, I've been listening to the forging table a bunch hmm. and a uh, couple of things. You need to tell one of your boys the word is inerrant, not inherent. He keeps calling it the inherent word of God. That means something pre-exists and is permanent. That's not what he means. He means without error. Right. And you got to tell your other guy who said he was a sensationist. He means cessationist. Cessationist. Like to cease, not that he is into sensational things. So got to help well, him thank, out. With... Well, thank you for giving me crap that I can dump on my buddies. <laughs> but nothing for me. I was perfect through all this, right? Is what no, you're saying? No, not Super perfect. Guys, he's, he, if you're not watching this on film, he is nodding. Yes, Kyle, you're perfect. Everything you said was completely in line. I do want to pull out a word that, that you said there in your answer just then, tension. So 
tension probably is a better word than nuance because again nuance is the the number one word that dumb people will use to sound smart but yeah. there's we're in this era and if you can especially look at this like if you're following politics nobody can have like a eh, i don't really know answer to a question you have to know exactly what you believe about tax policy exactly what you believe about us funding the ukrainian war exactly what we believe about january 6 exactly you have to have a fully fleshed out opinion right. about everything which leads to an attitude of not waiting to see like what i tell people every time that you know a a black young man dies at the hands of the police i was like guys let's wait about 48 hours to get just a modicum of detail before we can decide whether or not we need to burn our streets to the ground like or burn our buildings to the ground like let's just wait a second but it's kind of the same thing like i've told people i via email because i get a lot of emails about the reform stuff our media stuff all that and i'm like guys i'm figuring some of this stuff out I know all of you have long since, you know, checked all your different theological boxes and you know exactly what team you're playing for and what the scheduled time for the first game is on Sunday. But I'm not there on some of these issues. And another thing is like young earth creationism. People are desperate for me to have a young earth versus an older debate on my show. And I don't want to do it. Why? Because I don't give a crap if the (laughs) earth is 6,000 years old or if the earth is a hundred bajillion years old. Guess what? That doesn't change what happened on the cross. And it doesn't change the narrative of the scriptures. It doesn't mean that it's not important. It means it's not of utmost importance that I'm going to like bury my head in the sand for the next six months while I get ready for some debate. So tension versus nuance. I love that. So one thing before we move off and i'm actually going to give you an option here i'm going to pull a little bit of a of a fast one on myself no problem. probably my favorite part of the entire book like you made me cry on a plane you jerk was the story of ike brown but it is such an incredible story joby that and and there's so many different nuances to it that I'm going to give you the option. Either you can tell the story here to our listeners right now and leave out whatever details you want to leave out, or you can just go tell them to get the book because I don't want to, I don't want to just brush past that or speed past the story of Ike Brown and the stuff that happened in that man's life. So if you, you know your schedule. I don't. You make the decision. We're either going to talk about it right now in its, in its entirety, or you can tell people to just read the book. Do you have a preference? Well, yeah, of course I have a preference, but I just gave you the option. Some would say thank you and then go on with their life. You get to do whatever you feel called, whatever the spirit is leading you to do, Joby. You tell me. Uh, I'll tell you very, very briefly. Ike is a police officer whose son was murdered. And through a series of events, Ike adopts his son's murderer as his own son. So when I first heard this, this event... I met Ike. Ike now goes to our church. So I met him through our <clears throat> through the sheriff at that point, and he shares his story with me. And, you know, it's if I didn't know it to be true, you would think it's like a made-up thing. Like, the details of it are unbelievable. <clears throat> um, and, by the way, I don't know exactly when this will come out, but um, we're going to do an update on Ike's story this year for Easter in our Easter services. Yeah, this comes uh, out the day of the book, so it'll be out before then. Okay, so it'll be... so. Tune in, or at least, you know, watch 1122 online, and you'll get an update on, on Ike and Takoy. That's the guy. That's his, that's his adopted son. But when he first told me this story, that he's, he said, yeah, I adopted my son's murderer. And I said, that's the gospel. And then Ike goes, I never thought about it that way. And I'm like, what are you ta- how could you not think about it that way? That is it, <laughs> that we kill God's son, and God, in his love, adopts us into his family. It's unbelievable. I won't share the details. I mean, there's some like there's some some transcripts of letters back and forth that we put in the book, and um, yeah, man, it's just an unbelievable picture of our salvation that that we are the murderers of the Son of God, and the and God the Father adopted His Son's murderers as His very own. Well, and Joby, I read that chapter. Uh, because I was reading the book on my way out to Lewisburg prison, you know, my travels out there. And then I finished it on the way back. I read that after I had visited with those men in prison. And as I talked about on on my show uh, a couple of weeks back, I was hanging out with, interacting with, shaking hands with, hugging and praying with murderers, rapists, kidnappers, bank robbers, like literally all the people that are too dangerous to be in polite society which is why we have them locked up where we have them locked up and then i read that story 
And then I automatically, as any good reader of any narrative would do, you put yourself in the story. That's why we get scripture wrong so much is because we think we're David in the story of David and Goliath. But I'm putting myself in Ike's shoes, and I've got a two-year-old and a one-year-old son. And the, the level of evil things I would do to someone that would hurt those boys is only understood to everyone else in my audience that has sons or daughters, okay? That's right. So, which is almost all of you. And to hear him almost with, again, the details are in the book. You got to read the entire narrative in the book. But just like the moment he set eyes on his son's killer, he wasn't filled with anger. He wasn't filled with rage. He wasn't even filled with pity. Mm. He was filled with love. He loved him. And it, and it makes no sense to me that he would do that. That is about as otherworldly of an experience to where even that guy, maybe he doesn't have the words to fully express what he felt in that moment, but he saw he sees a young man who killed his son in cold blood and basically just said, well, that's my son now. And this was even months, if not years, I forget the timeline, before that, that any of that went down. So just an, just an absolutely unfathomable story. You guys got to pick up the book to read it. But let's go ahead and hop on to, uh, let's keep this going. Let's go to chapter 6. So this is called Mary Anoints Jesus. Hmm. Do you believe Jesus is worthy of worship no matter what? So in this chapter, you mention you know, many of the giants of the faith uh, from the past. So you mentioned Augustine, Luther, Spurgeon, John Owen, Brother Lords, A.W. Tozer. There's probably some in there that I, that I missed. Talk to me about the importance of modern Christians, not just listening to their favorite pastor's podcast because you're alive, so you can listen to somebody's podcast that's still alive as well. But to go back to what some people would call some of the church fathers, but just some of the giants of the faith, some of the giant thinkers of the faith, obviously the, the people of the Reformation in, in getting us to where we even have a, a revolution or even an understanding of how we should be able to do church now. You know, talk to us about the importance of that, but then also I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make you pick your favorite, you know, old dad friend. Which of those guys, if you couldn't read any of the others, who would be the guy that you would send under his tutelage the most? It could be one of those guys I mentioned or somebody else. Well, that's hard. Uh, probably the reason I, I I wanted to go back and grab some of these these quotes in the context of worship. Um, these guys were just playing a different game, man. This is way different than showing up during the second and a half song during the weekend service, and then you kind of sort of hum along while you drink a cup of coffee. That is different than John Owen saying, "Oh." And behold the glory of Christ, herein would I live, herein would I die, herein would I dwell in my thoughts and my affections until all things below become unto me a dead and deformed thing, no way suitable for affection that embraces. Dude, man, that's, that's bringing some passion. He's not getting hung up on worship style, you know? That joker is... Because what we're talking about here is when Mary bust open the the expen expensive ointment and pours it out on the feet of Jesus. And is that what you do when you go to church? I mean, we, we live in a society right now, man. It, it bums me out the amount of preachers that are just downplaying how important the weekend worship experience is in the life of the believer. I mean, I've heard guys say, listen, it's not all about just everybody showing up, singing a couple songs and listening to me do a little talk. Well, of course nothing's happening in your church if that's what you think church is. But my understanding of the scriptures, man, is that the saints have assembled and there's some outsiders here that God is drawing unto himself and supernatural things are happening in these moments. Marriages are being restored, prodigals are coming home, and the only eternal miracle is happening, salvation. And if you are not gripped and overcome with gratitude for what Christ did for you on the cross then you're not doing it right, man. That's why worship matters. That, that is the right response to the fact that the tomb is empty, is that you take the most valuable thing you have and you pour it out. Even if you look like a fool, you pour it out onto the feet of Jesus. And so, I mean, the most extreme one is Brother Lawrence, who says, I have had such delicious thoughts of the Lord that I scarce not speak of them. And I'm still of the camp that I don't think that's not the phrase I would use. I think you use delicious for food only. <laughs> yeah. But, well, he, but, but he's talking about that's different than like I did my quiet time. That's well, different, yeah. man. Well, and also you have to ask yourself, who are you in that story? Because, again, we all put ourselves in Scripture. We all do it no matter if we yep. admit to it or not. Yeah. Are you the woman breaking that, that jar and pouring over Jesus' feet? 
Or are you Judas in the background being like, oh, my gosh, that's so expensive. We could have sold that and given it to the poor. Because I'll, I'll be honest, for the majority of my life, it's been I've been Judas in the background. But I stopped before the we could even sell that and give it to the poor part because I haven't yeah. even been that charitable in my thinking. It's just been like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, you know, just think about it. That is you taking your Jordan 3s and setting them on fire for right. Jesus. That is you ripping up your King Griffey Jr. rookie card and tossing it at the feet of Jesus. That is you literally melting down your Ferrari and then just dumping it around Jesus so there's a glow around him for just five seconds. Like, Whatever your thing is, you're melting down, you know, your favorite hunting rifle, your favorite, you know, shoulder mount, your favorite, whatever, like that's what that is in that moment. And most of us just don't ever get there, but you did skirt my question. You got to pick one of them. Okay. So who's the one, if you had to pick one forever, that, that means you can't read a word. The rest of them said for the rest of your life, who are you taking? I'd probably go with Spurgeon because he, because he is a preacher. So I'd probably go with Spurgeon. You just made a lot of people in my audience happy. We got a lot of Spurgeon <laughs> folks in our audience. But I, I want to go ahead and go to, to chapter 8 here. So chapter 8 is the empty tomb. Do you believe God raised his son to life? And so I'm going to read a short quote from that chapter. And so when the Bible says he saw and believed, it doesn't mean believe that. It means believe in. Big difference. So I think this goes back to our discussion from earlier a little bit in terms of, you know, how the mystery almost of how one is saved. But I think specifically with this question, I want to ask it more in an intellectual capacity because I know there are people that come to Christ after an emotional experience. So they've gone to to the, the big, awesome preaching moment. They've gone to a so-called revival or they've gone to something somewhere. There's music that's played. They sing the chorus 47 times and the bridge 18 times and they raise their hands and then through that emotional experience where they were manipulated by chord changes, they accept Christ. I know that that happens. But then there are people that sit down with 17 books open at the library, and they use this one to cross-reference that one and blah, blah, and then they just like go, well, Dad, come it. This Middle Eastern Jew literally was resurrected from the dead. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so the emotional people will think the intellectual people are not feeling enough, and the intellectual people are thinking the emotional people are not thinking enough. But the the problem is is there is a mystery in the believe in and the believe that. Is it even possible for someone to believe that Jesus died for their sins, but then to not believe in it? And if I'm if I'm splitting too many hairs, let me know. But that's that's a thing of mystery for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, the answer would be yes, because the the it's a shame in my opinion that the Greek word pistuo even gets the word the English word believe associated with it. I think the um, trust would be a better a better translation. So like John 3.16 would say, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would trust, that'd probably be a better translation than believe, because you yourself admitted, being from Oklahoma, you would have considered yourself a Christian because you would have, you would have acknowledged God is God. He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross. He resurrected on the third day, and good people mm -hmm. go to heaven. Okay. So I'm trying to prevent people from that. The... My favorite illustration is when I was a little kid <clears throat> on the diving board and my dad would be in the deep end of the pool and I couldn't swim. And he would say, come on, buddy, jump. At that moment, I knew that was my dad. But I was not pestuoing in my dad. It wasn't until I took the full weight of my life and trusted it in his hands, knowing that if he doesn't catch me, I drown. That's a, that is what the Bible is talking about when it says pestuo or believe in um, you know, you believe that Texas Tech is a school, but you don't believe in them. Just well, like I no believe one does, right? Because <laughs> they're terrible. I would hope not, but they yeah. exist. We know they exist. But right. that's different than like putting your whole life, the weight of your life, onto. Um, now, I don't think you can believe in without believing that. Like, I'm not trying to make this just purely a, an emotional thing. Like Romans ten nine. If you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I don't care what you believe in, you ain't going to heaven. Like that, so there is the historical fact, um, <clears throat> and and those things happened. But the question is, have you put your trust in Jesus and who He says He is and what He did on the cross for your sin? Yeah, I think that's very helpful because for a lot of people, I, I don't know if you said it in the book or just just saw it somewhere else. There was that guy that was walking back and forth over Niagara Falls on a tightrope, yeah. and then he that's was, you know, book. walk. 
Okay, then he's walking a wheelbarrow back and forth, and right. then he says, you know, hey, who thinks that I could get you back and forth across Niagara Falls in this wheelbarrow? And a lot of people, you know, raise their hands, and he said, who, you know, who would like to volunteer? And nobody raises their hands anymore. It's That's like, it. okay, you believe that? It's something he could do, but you're not going to put your faith in him because if you get it wrong, you both die. So I want to go ahead and, and go to chapter 9, we'll, and we'll make this the, the last question I ask about the book. But chapter 9 is called The Gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection? So there was a very, very interesting quote here that I want to get a little bit more on, and here it is. In our current culture, we get baptized with both hands out of the water. In one hand, we hold our wallet, and in the other, we hold our sexuality. Bottom line, if he's not Lord of all, He's not Lord of all, Lord at all. And so it's just an interesting <clears throat> image to to imagine because everyone, I think at this point, has seen full you know immersion baptism. But to see somebody like what if they did get baptized and they were holding, you know, their car keys and, you know, uh, their their favorite book, you know, out of the water, you'd be like, that's kind of weird. Like, what is it about the, your car or that that book that you that you think is so interesting? And that book's not the Bible. But the thing that I think we've gotten into now And this bleeds into a discussion of big time, big personality, big following pastors that refuse to talk about things like sexuality. So I've been very, very adamant and forward. And you and I have talked a lot offline about a guy uh, that people may have heard of named Andy Stanley, who refuses to talk about homosexuality and to condemn it as as a sin. And again, as you and I have discussed, it's different for what a pastor should say from a pulpit versus a guy on a podcast, you know, throwing sticks of dynamite. But at the same time. My concern is that pastors in the ilk of Andy Stanley are leading people to hell because he's not holding up a mirror and saying, yep, your sin, whatever your sin is that you're doing right now, that is the sin that makes you depraved and that will send you to hell, right? And, you know, everyone's got their varsity sins. Yeah, we want to talk about homosexuality, but we don't want to talk about gluttony, right? You know, everyone's got their favorite sin that they like to, you know, talk about from the rooftops and the one they like to ignore. But the problem that we're seeing is this isn't a... a, unique thing that's happening like Andy Sandy isn't unique he's just a millionaire pastor that is saying it behind the biggest microphone and so that's the problem that I think a lot of people are getting into is they're not even getting to the baptismal waters where they have the opportunity to stick both of their hands out churches are just becoming a place to where it's just like hey here's a social club where you can come and hang out and we're not going to talk about your sin so just come on in the water's fine so go with that wherever you want to go but that that's that's such a problem for me and I know I'm a crazy crazy person always looking for a fight but even for the people that are more subdued and relaxed they they just don't know what to do with that because that is the culture of modern christianity that their kids are going to be inheriting and they don't like it uh the illustration that i give i stole from uh the the middle ages that's how crusaders would get baptized i don't know if you know this they would get baptized Mm -hmm. with their their hand with their sword out of the water because they knew the atrocious things they were about to go do in the name Mm -hmm. of jesus and so these days, we don't necessarily have a sword. It's primarily, I think, money and sexuality. Um, <clears throat> so it is in church history. Those kinds of baptisms did happen. It's kind of sick, right? Sure. Now, yeah. I, man, you just got to... My same answer is when you were asking about salvation. If you teach the Bible, you're going to have to teach on sin. And so at our church, what we primarily do is just teach through books of the Bible. Right now we're in Philippians. Next will be James. <clears throat> Sometimes we do topical things. We do family series or financial series, um, which is totally fine, at least in my opinion, because the, the epistles, that's what they were. You know, Paul was speaking to specific topics that that specific church dealt with. So I think that's fine. But um, I, I don't know, man. I If you teach the full counsel of the Word of God then I don't know how you don't teach on sin, particularly the sin of sexuality and and the crazy times that we live in. Now, man, I try to do it with grace and truth, you know. Um, in, in regards to, like, homosexuality, we did 37 weeks in the book of Romans. Well, man, it's going to hit it pretty hard a few times, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, it's one thing to just be right uh, it's another thing to help try to lead people to a right relationship with Jesus. Now, you cannot do that by misdiagnose, misdiagnosing the sickness and sin. That doesn't help anybody. But, man, you sure can do it in a way that, that is loving and careful and empathetic. Man, I'm just telling you, there, there are people that I know that struggle with same-sex attraction, and this world has tried to tell them, first of all, they shouldn't be at our church. 
They, this world tries to tell them that we can't love each other. And yeah. this world tries to tell them that that is their primary identifier. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to simultaneously just tell them what the Bible says. Um, and it says that if you are in Christ, that is your primary identifier. That, it, that, that there's no adjectives are needed before the word Christian. You're just a Christian, not a certain kind of one. <laughs> um, but then you just got to call people to repent and follow after Jesus, man. Because if he, again, if, if he's not, if you're not, if you're not submitting yourself to him, saying, I'm not the boss of me, you are. Whether I agree with it or not, I'm going to do what you say, not what I say. Or at least what I understand the Bible to say to the best of my ability surrounded in a faithful community. I mean, that's what we're calling people to. So I don't know if you got a bunch of preachers listening to this or not, but just trust the power of the Word of God. That's where the power is, not in your cute sermons and, and, and the way you package it up. And so that's what we do here. We just teach we just teach the Word of God, so wherever it goes, I go. And boy, there's sometimes I, I can't explain to you how uncomfortable I am. And But I don't do the Thomas Jefferson Bible and just cut out the parts I don't like. Well, and I got to say, you know, I go around and speak at churches on probably the most uncomfortable topic to speak on, and that's abortion. But I start with that. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's like, right. can we all just acknowledge what's happening in the room right now? I know the statistics. There are women in this room that have killed their babies with abortion. There are men in this room that have paid for it, that have driven them and picked them up. There are family members that paid for this problem to go away so no one would know that their daughter's just kind of a skank. Like, all of those situations are happening in this room. So let's build from there that, guys, I'm not going to trick you at the end and say, you're all murderers and Christ can't save you. It's right. like, can we just pretend that Jesus died for those sins as well? Right. But that, that's the thing that I, I'm just curious about this, Joby, is for these pastors, these prominent pastors that have these huge platforms, <coughs> excuse me, I guess what, I try to steel man the other side. I think straw manning is super easy. That's why people do it. But steel manning is where you put up the best version of the other argument or the people that disagree with you and you try to knock that down. Because if you can do that, you know your position is solid. I try to put myself in the in the the mindset of these people, these pastors that not the ones that are you know hanging out the LGBTQ uh, cla you know flags outside the congregations and you know ordaining women and all that, not that, but just the people that won't say that certain things are sinful. They have no problem saying adultery is sinful. They have no problem hate saying hating people is sinful, premarital sex. They'll say all these things, but then when it gets to homosexuality specifically. They won't talk about it. And then when you get to transgenderism, their heads basically explode because they're just a gaggle of nonsense slogans, one right after the other. And I love what Vody Bauckham said recently. He said when, when most pastors preach on homosexuality, their sermon dies the death of a thousand qualifications before they get their first point out because they're like, you know, we have a lot of homosexual people that we know, and there's homosexual people in this church, and we just want to let you know that we love you, and Jesus loves you. And he's like, imagine someone saying, you know, we've got a lot of pedophiles at our church, or, you know, we got a lot of, I know a lot of pedophiles. I got a lot of pedophiles that are my friends, and Jesus loves you. And it's like, that would sound really, really weird, but it's the same on the homosexuality thing. I guess, what what is the idea that the that these people are doing? Like, what exactly do they think they're accomplishing by not talking about it, other than, you know, making nice with the people at, you know, relevant magazine or something. Um, so if I try to play the steel man, cause I preach about it as often as the books of the Bible I'm preaching preaches about it. Makes sense. So absolutely. I'm not, you hear me preach. So I, I try to handle it. I do try to handle it with, with, uh, with love and compassion. You know, I mean, Jesus, there's just a lot of people who wants to throw stones, man. There just are on both sides. <clears throat> and what often what happens, though, Kyle, is the moment you are starting to try to, like, rally the base as a preacher, that's different than shepherding a group of people towards a destination. And there's a lot of really conservative, and look, dude, I'm as conservative as it gets in regards to my theology. There's a bunch of really conservative preachers that are really just preaching to the other conservative preachers and the really conservative audiences that know they're going to get the biggest cheer when they say the most divisive thing, and they've got a Bible verse to do it. And, and there's a core of that that is very similar to the guy that's really scared to say anything because he's trying to get his, he's trying to rally his base which is more progressive and more like, even if I believe it's wrong, let's just not talk about it because it's uncomfortable. 
So right. sometimes they can these two people that are saying the exact opposite thing, it's coming from the same space, man. And it's a, it's the, a little bit of the applause of man. So you just got to be careful with that. So I don't care what Relevant Magazine thinks about me, or I don't care what Vody Bauckham thinks about me. And I know Vody, Vody a little bit. We helped take care of him when he was having some health issues here in Jacksonville because he was at the Mayo. And I appreciate his ministry, but I appreciate a lot of people's ministry. I know for me and my church, there will be a day that I stand before the Lord and give an account. And here's the conversation I have pre-decided that I refuse to have with the Lord. If God were to say to me, hey, how come you never, my, my word clearly talks about homosexuality. Why didn't you talk about it? And me go, oh, I don't know, it made me uncomfortable. I'd rather be uncomfortable today and really comfortable then than to have those things reverse. Okay, fair now, enough. <clears throat> now, if, but I just made a case on why you should. All right, I think what those folks are thinking <clears throat> is if we can just get them here and understand it's not by works that you're saved. So we don't have a whole list of sins that you have to quit doing before you meet Jesus. I think what they're thinking is, let's just meet Jesus and then we'll handle this. Let's go justification first, and then we'll handle the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God in your life then. So let's not prioritize something that's not the priority because the priority is, do you know that you're a sinner? Do you believe Jesus came to die on the cross to save sinners? Do you believe? And I think... They prioritize that to the point. I think that would be a pretty good explanation. However, just because something is not the priority does not mean it's not essential. So that's the problem, I think. So the resurrection is the priority, period. But that, it's not the only essential doctrine in the scriptures. Like the, mo the highest priority in your life right now has got to be air, right? Sure. But that doesn't mean it's the only essential thing for life. If you don't eat for three months, you're going to die, regardless if you have air. So I think you just got to teach the whole Bible. Um, I'm telling you, though, man, if you're not trying to just be right all the time, but you're trying to be used as a conduit to lead people into a right relationship with Jesus, and, and then quite honestly, if the people that you're talking to know that you love them, I, can I can't tell you the amount of same-sex couples, Kyle, that we have actively attend our church. They're here every week. And at some point, you're like, guy, you know, guys or girls. It's mostly girls. I don't know why. But you're like, what's going on here? And they're like, we love you. We think you're awesome. You're a great preacher. We love the way you unpack the word. And I'm like, but you've heard me teach Romans 1. They're like, yeah, we think you're wrong on that. But nobody's perfect. <laughs> All right. I mean, I don't know what to We're not going to kick them out. They're not going to be covenant members. But we hold, we hold people to the same standard. Now, the one thing I do think is important is that sexual sin is a category unto itself, 1 Corinthians 6. Mm -hmm. But I do think in this day and age, it's really important that when you talk about homosexuality, you should be covering all sexual immorality. Sure. But you, you better be ready to hammer the, the couple sleeping together, which they all are just as much as you are homosexuality. Now, it is a bit different because, because as Romans 1 says, one is against creation order, but all throughout the scriptures, Paul and Jesus both put it in the same junk drawer of sexual sin, which would be porneo. So when to, I, that's, that's what I try to do. I just try to let the person that's struggling with same-sex attraction realize that they have a very similar struggle than the guy struggling with pornography and lust next to him. It's not the same, but it's in according to the Bible, it's in the same category. And they and we all need to repent and be saved. Well, that's why I think I've heard Christians say, even that go to my church, they're just like, ah, you know, Kyle, you know, homosexuality is just like, you know, lying or, you know, cheating on your taxes mm. or something like that. It's like, no, if you, if you believe, uh, if you believe that Paul's words are, uh, you know, spoken to him through God and he wrote them down, then you, you see that as a categorical difference. It is a categorically different sin. That's a church camp thing that all, all, you know, <coughs> sins are weighted the same. Like well, we don't get that when we look at scripture. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a total misunderstanding. So the phrase is true. Like, all sin is sin in regards to salvation like sure. any one little sin is enough the broadest possible category that would make you uh miss the mark and you don't get to go to heaven because you're a sinner that is true but there's no i mean anybody that reads the scriptures can understand that there are there are categories of sin and different sins have different consequences the, yeah, yeah and, i mean it's clear 
Well, and I think the, the thing I wrote down is like behavioral modification. There are these, you know, seeker sensitive churches that don't want to focus on behavioral modification because it's almost like they want to come in through the back door, forgive the pun, on some of these, you know, uh, sins and different things like that. Like they, they want to go that route because it's like, hey, we want to introduce you to Jesus before we start talking about all this persnickety stuff about, you know, you sleeping with your boyfriend, that that type of thing. Um so, so one thing that I want to talk about as well, and this is, you know, tangentially involved with the, the thing that we just got through talking about, you know, with homosexuality, I want to talk about this movement because again, you know, I used to be a big time follower of Andy Stanley and then I, he's completely fallen out of favor with me. So just so I can be an equal opportunity offender, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and bring Matt Chandler into this, a guy that I've loved for a long time and I still love. And then JD Greer, a guy that I've had no opinion on for a long time. And now I'm just kind of paying attention to him a little bit closer, but all those three guys that I've talked about, Andy Stanley, Matt Chandler, J.D. Greer, and a bunch of others have talked about things like critical race theory, which comes from critical theory, which comes from the Frankfurt School, which comes from critical legal studies, which comes from Marxism, which comes from Satan's butthole. Like They say that critical race theory is just a lens through which we can understand the plight of people in this country that have a particular level of melanin, otherwise known as their immutable characteristics that they can't change. And... When I see pastors of any ilk, whether I follow them and like them, don't follow them, have no opinion on them, that concerns the bejesus out of me that you would use these things. And it's almost like you don't understand that you're playing with fire. You don't understand that you just let a rattlesnake loose in your pants. And the fact that he hasn't bit you yet is a grace of God. It's not that you're right. It's that you're lucky. And so I struggle with these pastors that will bring in a biblical concepts that are not just a biblical concepts. These are satanic concepts that are completely oil to the water of scripture. But then they're just like, it's this pragmatism. It's like, oh, we're just being pragmatic. We're just trying to understand and we're just trying to do these other things. So as opposed to going to scripture, we're going to go to, you know, uh, Ibram X. Kendi, or we're going to go to any of these other, you know, made up authors and theologians of this particular worldview help me understand that because that's not something that i've heard you do but it's like it's so popular now that even the southern baptist convention's like yeah sure why not bring it in let's just let's just have critical race theory hey how about we do a seance at our next you know sbc meeting just to see if we're missing anything so save me before i say another thing that'll get that, me canceled that might be a jump there okay so <coughs> I, I don't know andy we've met a couple times <clears throat> Matt Chandler is one of my dearest friends and JD Greer is one of my dearest friends. And I just you need to know this dude. These these are gospel-centered, bible-believing men of God. And they're better dudes than there are preachers and they're two of the best preachers our country has ever seen in the history of our country. And they love the Lord and they love the scriptures and they are not deviating from the scripture. The one thing I would see, I would check is when exactly did they say some of these things? And the reason I say that is because I used to, I ran a, <clears throat> I ran a class here at our church, like pre George Floyd days, right. called the Gospel and Race, because the amount of deep seated racism in Jacksonville is unbelievable. And the way I know that is because anytime you poke the bear, anytime I poke the bear about racism here, bro, you ought to see the hateful emails I get. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have one of my dear friends who is an African-American preacher come in and preach, and he preached on race. And some of the, I, I mean, dude, I, just racist emails I got from our people. So it's deep there. So what I was trying to do with this gospel and race class is a four week class. And I'd bring some of my buddies in black pastors in and we would, we would start kind of, cause I'm trying to shepherd this flock and we are starting in, in a not good place. And we are trying to move people towards, um, we'll use Bible language that when Christ came, he tore down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. So that's what we're trying to do in the gospel. Okay. Not some kind of weird affirmative action thing and, and because it's the church, all right? And so there are some things I was saying and pushing even a few years ago that it seems to me has almost been like hijacked in the past few years. And it's like those words don't even mean what we were using them for a few years ago, okay? Mm. So when the SBC votes on the critical race theory thing, bro, there ain't a brother among us that even know what we're talking about. We don't, we don't I mean, I'm not an SBC guy, so I'm not even, I can't. Thank God, right. I'm nothing. I'm, we're a mutt 
There ain't no way I join a <laughs> denomination right now. Are you kidding me? I can't. I mean, they're all a mess. So anyway, <clears throat> but there's some stuff that that I mean, there's some people that there's a few people that know the history and all of that kind of stuff. I know what JD is trying to do at the Summit Church, and I know what Matt is trying to do at the Village Church is have a church that looks like Revelation with all kinds of different tribes, tongues, nations. That that is rooted and and grounded in the gospel. And so anybody that talks as much as we do, it wouldn't be very hard for you to go back enough years and find something I said, and that word doesn't even fully mean what it's what it means anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um. I mean, well, this like, is, like, take, take the, here's an example. Boy, this is going to be in trouble. Yeah. This will be awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, We're the, an hour the, and a half in. People probably tuned us out. It's only the super fans that are still hanging around, so you're fine. I don't care. Man. I, we're buddies, so I just feel like <laughs> we'd be talking anyway. We might as well record it. Let's go. All right, so uh, Eric Mason writes a book called Woke Church a bunch of years ago, way before the word woke was a thing. Right. Okay. Bro, we gave it to our church. We we're like, you should read this. Have you even, did you even realize redlining was a thing? Ain't a person in our church, ain't a white person in our church had ever even heard that there was a disparity in how the GI Bill was handed out. They're like, what? Okay. I think those are some things people need to know about recent history. Now, absolutely. Would I use the phrase uh, systemic racist, that our country is systemically racist? I would be like, hold on. Today, you can, I, I, there's, I'd stay away from those words. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't touch those words. Now, would I say in our history there were systems that were, were, were racist? 100%. Are people That's, racist? Yep. Yes. Okay, so, but there's some of those things. Dude, today, I wouldn't use the word woke. I think woke is, in its current vernacular, woke is like of the devil. It is demonic. It is Marxist. It is not about race only. It's about transgenderism. I mean, it has just morphed into this whole thing. That that if you could see this monster when it first peeked his head up, you'd be like, "That's the devil." So yeah. that's I would give some guys a little grace on the on the. Now, see these two guys, Matt and Matt and JD, are easy for me. I know them. I know their hearts. Right. I know what they're doing. Um, they are, these well, are just great commission Bible preaching guys. Okay, just so just know that. But could you go back to some language that has been used in the past and think, eh? For sure. Well, so so a couple of quick things. Number one, my biggest problem with J.D. Greer is that he doesn't have a podium. Like, can we raise some money? Let's get a GoFundMe together. <laughs> Let's get this guy a podium so, he can his set thing, his, man. so we can set his binder down so he's not reading it to me. Just email it. If you're just going to read it to me, just email it to me, J.D., but on specifically on Matt because I believe I'll have my dates right. Um, but So Matt Chandler used to do, I'm trying to remember all four, but every January he would do a sermon about abortion. He would yep. do a sermon about, you know, uh, you know, a, you know, sending out, you know, going to the ends of the earth to spread the gospel. He'd do one about race, and then there was a fourth one that I can't remember. I think prayer. I think prayer was Okay, fourth. prayer. That, that's right. And then, you know, there would be updates on what's happening at the village, you know, all, you know, spread out right. throughout that. I believe this was January 2021. He talked about critical race theory being something, and he said the same thing you did. The moment I talk about race, you won't believe the emails I'm going to get. You won't believe the DMs I'm going to get, and everyone believes them because, you know, that's not shocking. It shouldn't be shocking to anybody that there are morons out there that believe those things. But, the way that Matt Chandler framed it, that was so highly and deeply inappropriate, and I don't have the exact words, but this is the sentiment, is that we're going to use things like critical race theory and some of those different theories to understand the plight of people of color here in this country. And if you dare call us Marxists for doing so, you're wrong, and that's of the devil. I, I about blew my top knot. I could not believe that he said that it goes back to what we were saying earlier to where it's like no one has any tension that they're holding with these types of things it was a declarative statement that if you say the marxist things that he was doing were marxist in their intent and origin that that was coming from satan that was the thing where i was like wait a minute you're my boy, Matt Chandler. I considered moving to Nowheresville, Texas, just to go to your church before. Like, I will veer out of my way on vacation to go sit in your pews on a Sunday morning just to hear you talk live and scream at me and then whisper and then scream and then whisper. But what in the world was that? So I think that's the problem is when somebody is agreeing, 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 agreeing with the things that the pastor's saying, and they feel convicted, convicted, convicted. And then we get to this. We're made to feel like we're the racists for simply hearing that and being like, wait a minute, 
you're not going to call me satanic because apparently I know way more about Marxism than you do. Does that make sense? Yeah, but just first, just ask, your, ask yourself the question, are you? Like, what is it in you that gets so defensive? We're defensive about the, just the subject of race in general? Yeah, about being called a racist if you are anti-critical race theory. Just, just real quick. Yeah. I mean, because me well, too, so, man. Yeah. Well, let me, I, I let, me, a, let me answer I that. Have a because tendency, I have a tendency to not hold the mirror up first. Fair, fair enough. Know? So I think that's fair to hold the mirror up and point it back at somebody. So I've gotten to a point in my life and in my career where there's not a word you can use to describe me that's going to make me do anything other than giggle. You can call me anything. And as long as you don't put hands on me or my family, you can go on living your life, buddy, and there's not going to be any consequences. But it's, it's the true injustice of pointing at somebody and calling them something that they are so clearly not. That's where it drives me insane. It's, you know, it's somebody that's blue and you're calling them purple. It's one of those situations. So it, it couldn't, it could be about the abortion issue. It could be about any other issue that is a hot button issue. It just so happens to be that he's bringing in something from the pits of hell an ideology from the pits of hell. And he's saying it to these you know, people in his crowd that are basically just like sheep shaped sponges and they're just going to go with whatever Matt Chandler says. And then there's going to be that five to 10 percent of people that are going to get mad and fire off an email. That's the thing. It's not the racism part. Like, it's not any of that. Like, because I don't look at anyone's immutable characteristic and be like, well, I'm going to define you by that. Now, you are a brown person. You are a yellow person. You are a white person. You are well, whatever. So well, I'll say it this way. So uh, I, I haven't heard that particular sermon that you're talking about. So I would. I would need to go listen to it, or I'll just I ask, I'll ask Matt about it. Now, let me give you a for instance. <clears throat> um, I've never told my congregation which way I vote, <coughs> though you have heard me preach multiple times on the sanctity of human life, so it doesn't take a lot to figure it out. Sure. But I don't know. I would say 80 85% of our church is Republican, maybe something like that. That might be low. So I will say things that just try to rile the Republicans up because I'm trying to shepherd them. Right. I'm trying to get them to, like, why do you trust Tucker Carlson more than you trust the Apostle Paul? Hmm. You know? So I would say some stuff that I don't even necessarily agree with, um, and particularly on hot-button topics, on stuff like immigration. And, you know, there's some, there's some things I think about that, you know? And 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 they are all the exact same things that you think I would think about them. Sure. That most people that look like I do think about them. But when I'm preaching it, man, I want people, you know, I might, if we're talking about that and about love for neighbor, I will say some things that just walk all over people's toes. Because oftentimes that's what it takes to require somebody to like wake up and be like, because the thing you always, always want to pay attention to, me too, is when I get this like vehement response of defensiveness about something. Just as a follower of Jesus, you may want to go, hey, what's going on in here? Now, there yep. are times where it is righteous anger for sure, you know, and then there are other times you're like, ah, man, I'm holding on to some traditions of man here and not being fully submitted and surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Race is a big one, and especially in the South, bro, especially in the South. And, um, and sometimes it requires, now again, I'm not, I am not defending, I personally, I think critical race theory is at odds with Romans chapter 5. And you, you either believe that you're a son of Adam or that everything's a power dynamic. That's, right? I don't think you can sure. simultaneously adopt both. So, but <clears throat> I would just pay attention to that in your own life. If there's somebody that you respect or you genuinely trust and there's something where you get, you feel overly defensive, like what's going on? What's going on in me that I need to pay attention to? Is there some area that God wants to do some work in me on? Well, if you could just do me a solid, when you're about to do that to me, would you just give me a heads up so I'm not just like scrolling through my podcast feed and all of a sudden I'm getting mad? Because I'm focused, right? When I listen to you, it's whenever I'm trying to lift really heavy things off yeah. the ground and set them back down again. Are you just going to give me a heads up? Can you just agree to that? Yeah, no problem.
No okay, problem. sounds good. Well, Joby, we've gone everywhere in this conversation. We really dug into the new book, Anything is Possible. I could not recommend it uh, more highly, and then we went into some other areas that hopefully it isn't going to make the world too mad at us. But is there anything we didn't cover before we get you out of here? I, as I understand it, you're about to go get some uh, you know, well-earned time off. Is there anything you want to check out or talk about before we let you do that? Oh, man, we didn't talk about jujitsu. We didn't talk about hunting. We didn't, you we got have... more time? You got more time? Because I got more time. <laughs> no, nah, I probably need to go. I got a sermon to <laughs> polish up for tonight but well i will say it's not going to be the last this is your third appearance on this show but if you're going to be able to be one of those guys that's like up there in that top three echelon of most requested repeat guests obviously we're going to tee up some more conversations about hunting and jujitsu but for now that's all for me is there anything else you want to get off your chest that's it man hey i'm praying for you and your surgery and all that that's a big deal like in fact our whole prayer team at 1122 and our elders and our deacons are they are praying for you by name. Is it April 10th? Is that right? April 10th. That's yeah. the day. Yeah, we're praying for you, man, because uh, God has given you a voice, and the enemy would love nothing more than to take that thing away. And so we are praying for miracles. And here's, here's what I want you to think about. <clears throat> um, what you are going to experience through the miracle of doctors and medicine and technology, it's, it's all a gift from God because he is a great physician, right? And mm-hmm. what they would have called a miracle 100 years ago, they call a procedure today. That's God's goodness. <laughs> Hey, that is his goodness, but I've already got a plan in place. I'll just tell you, nobody else, listen, turn your ears off. So if the surgery goes really, really bad and my voice is just gone, I'm going to be the first male Christian conservative podcaster whose podcast is done solely through AI voices. Okay, so (laughs) I'm going to type up all the things that I want to say, and then I'm just going to hit the button on the AI, and then they're going to say it. And it's going to sound vaguely like me. (coughs) It's probably not going to have, you know, near the charm and near the flow, but I'm going to do my level best. But Let's just hope it doesn't get there. I certainly appreciate you, the elders, and the prayer team there at Church of 1122 to do that. Joby Martin, thank you for coming back on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. My pleasure. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the return appearance of Joby Martin on the show. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So the links I've got for you today, I've got a link to the Church 1122 website. i got a link to where you can, you can go buy your copies of Anything is Possible and If the Tomb is Empty, and also a link to Joby's Instagram page. Thank you guys for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is our song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album leveler the links are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep pushing back darkness keep forging spiritual mental and physical resilience keep seeking the lion of judah <laughs>